If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Samuel in chapter 3. 2 Samuel chapter 3. We've taken, for the past two weeks, we've taken a break from 2 Samuel, and we're going to get back into it here this morning. And this will actually be our fourth morning in the uh, in 2 Samuel in chapter 3. I didn't quite plan on spending this many mornings in this chapter, but there is a great deal in the early chapters of 2 Samuel. And it's actually been a little bit of a point of frustration for me because as I get ready for my sermons, I usually go and read some commentators and see just what they have to say and what their thoughts are. And quite a few commentators, they will actually just kind of skip over the first few chapters of 2 Samuel, or they'll just kind of lump them all together and just uh, kind of skim over them, just review them, summarize them a little bit, which is a bit of a, first of all, it makes it a little bit difficult when I'm trying to work through the text myself, but it's actually, it's a shame just because there is so much here that we can learn from in these early chapters of 2 Samuel, and today is no exception to that. We're going to start in verse 22 of 2 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to go, we're not going to go to the end of the chapter. I wanted to go to the end of the chapter, but you don't want to listen to me for the next hour. So, part B will be coming next week. Verse 22 on through to verse 27. Just then, David's men and Joab returned from a raid and brought with them a great deal of plunder. But Abner was no longer with David in Hebron because David had sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab and all the soldiers with him arrived, he was told that Abner, son of Ner, had come to the king and that the king had sent him away and that he had gone in peace. So Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why did you let him go? Now he is gone. You know Abner, son of Ner. He came to deceive you and observe your movements and find out everything you are doing. Joab then left David and sent messengers after Abner. And they brought him back from the well of Sirah. But David did not know it. Now when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the gateway as though to speak with him privately. And there to avenge the blood of his brother Asael, Joab, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. Those are the verses that we're going to consider this morning. I encourage you to keep your Bible open in front of you because we don't have the PowerPoint here. And I'm going to make reference to this passage that we've just read quite frequently. It'll be good for you to have it in front of you. Verse 22 there. You will notice it starts out with the two words... Just then, at least it does in the NIV that I'm going off of here this morning. Just then, and we would ask the question, just when? Uh, what are we referring to? What do you mean just then? And we have to back up a little bit for context just to recall what is going on. And so if you look back to verse 21, we read, Then Abner said to David, Let me go at once and assemble all Israel for my Lord the King, so that they may make a compact with you, and that you may rule over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away in peace. You will remember that Abner, he was the commander of Saul's army. Saul is now dead, and he had propped up Ishbosheth to be the current king of Israel. And the two of them, Ishbosheth and Abner, they actually had a falling out. They got upset, Abner got upset with Ishbosheth and he switched his allegiance to David. He transferred his allegiance from, from Ishbosheth to David. And now Abner, he is now making it his life's work to make David Israel's king and to get all Israel to rally around him. And Abner, he has now gone to David in peace and said to him what we just read in verse 21. He basically said, let me go and convince all Israel to make you their king. And if you look at 21, you will notice one word that pops up in there. Very important word at the end. So David sent Abner away in peace, it says. He sent him away in peace. I draw your attention to that word because it shows up elsewhere in the narrative that we just read. And words that show up often, uh, show up often in the text, you're usually supposed to give them your attention. In verse, it shows up again in verse 22, as well as in verse 23. 
Verse 22, the latter half reads, but Abner was no longer with David in Hebron because David had sent him away and he had gone in peace. And you find the exact same thing in verse 23. The king had sent him away and he had gone in peace. David and Abner, you'll recall, they are essentially enemies at this point here. They're essentially enemies. The, at the beginning of the chapter, it says that the war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. They're at war. They're enemies here. But David, he has sent Abner away in peace. David, what is going on here? David is wanting the kingdom of Israel to be transferred to him peacefully. And that's important to understand because it plays a part in the rest of the text here. He wants the, the, he wants the kingdom to be transferred to him peacefully. There's been war so far. There's been bloodshed. David, he doesn't want any more needless bloodshed. He wants it to happen peacefully. He knows the kingdom is going to be his because the Lord has promised that it will be his. He wants it to happen, though, peacefully, which is admirable. But then along comes Joab. The commander of David's army. You see, Abner was the commander of, of Ishbosheth's army, and now there is Joab, the commander of David's army. It was said of David that he was a man after God's own heart. That was not said of Joab. Joab, as you can see here, he's not the most saintly figure. Joab. He heard about what David did, that he had sent Abner away in peace. And boy, oh boy, did that ever ruffle his feathers. He was not happy to say the least. David is his king, Joab's king, but he is not happy with the decision that David has made to send Abner away in peace. It would be much like, friends, you not being happy with your boss at work because they have made a decision that you don't like. And if you've ever had a job, I think we've all, we've all been there at some point in time. The person you answer to, the person who's in authority over you, they've made a decision and you're sitting there shaking your head going, what in the world are they doing? It's, you're thinking to yourself, What's go, what, what are they thinking? They're, this is an obviously stupid and incredibly foolish mistake that they are making. And that is the way, my friends, that Joab is feeling about David's decision to send Abner away in peace. Verse 24, if you have it there in front of you, it says, So Joab went to the king and said, What have you done? One commentator he said this of Joab's words. These are the words of an accuser to an accused. If we were going to translate that verse and just put it into our modern English culture, our modern English language, it would be, um, he's essentially saying, what in the world have you done? Question mark, exclamation mark, question mark, exclamation mark. What have you done? What are you thinking, David? How foolish can you be? That's, that's essentially the attitude that he is displaying before his king. The commentator Matthew Henry said, I know not whether to wonder more that Joab had impudence enough to give such an affront to his prince, or that David had patience enough to take it. He does, in effect, call David a fool when he tells him he knew Abner came to deceive him, and yet he trusted him. Joab is incredibly brazen towards his king here. And as Matthew Henry points out, for some reason, whatever it is, it is David just takes it. If you or I go up to our boss and with that kind of an attitude and say, what in the world have you just done? It might be your last day on the job. For whatever reason, though, for whatever reason, David did not fire Joab, as maybe he should have done. Joab, what he does is he goes and he takes matters into his own hands. He doesn't like what David has done. And he goes and takes matters into his own hands. It is true, my friends, that when people decide to, quote unquote, take matters into their own hands... It's seldom 
if ever, turns out to be a good idea. Not that I'm speaking from life experience or anything like that. But you know how it is. You say, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to fix this myself. I'm going to look after this. And how, how, well, how often does that usually turn out well? Usually not very often. Usually what follows is something stupid and wrong that you end up having to apologize for. I give you just a couple examples in Scripture of guys who have taken matters into their own hands. I thought, first of all, of Simon Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane. The guards come to arrest Jesus. Simon Peter thinks to himself, essentially says, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. In John 18, 10 to 11, Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? He, he scolds him outright for taking matters into his own hands. And then, of course, there is the classic example of King Saul, who was supposed to wait ten, uh, seven days to, uh, for Samuel to arrive to, uh, so that Samuel could perform the sacrifice. And pressure is mounting upon Saul. And so what does Saul do? Saul do? He takes matters into his own hands. It's in 1 Samuel 13, verses 8 to 9. He waited seven days and the, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. And shortly thereafter, Samuel showed up on the scene. This is Saul taking matters into his own hands. And again, just as in the case of Peter, he gets scolded for doing it. Joab is another example of someone who takes matters into his own hands. After asking his king or telling his king, what in the world have you done? How foolish could you be? He goes out and he actively conspires to kill Abner. And then he kills him. And the reason he does so is not because... Abner had supposedly deceived David as Joab claimed. You know, what he said to him, why did you let him go? He came here to spy out. That's not the reason. Verse 27 gives the reason. Now when Abner returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the gateway as though to speak with him privately and there to avenge the blood of his brother Asael, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. One commentator wrote, Joab was not concerned about the security of David's kingdom as he had implied with when he rebuked the king. We now see that he, not Abner, had deceived David. Joab's fury was over his brother's earlier death at Abner's hands. You'll remember from chapter 2, when war was taking place, Joab's brother, Joab's brother, Asael, was pursuing Abner. And Abner said to him, don't pursue me. Don't follow after me. Told it to him twice. Asael didn't listen. And then we read what happened in verse 23 of chapter 2. But Asael refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asael's stomach and the spear came out through his back. I read... I. I read what happened to Asael, and I actually, I find it difficult to fault Abner for killing Asael. First of all, it was done in a time of war. It was done in a time of war, which, which means it was not an act of murder. Second, Asael was almost, he was almost certainly pursuing Abner not to give him a friendly hug, okay? likely pursuing him to kill him. And third, Abner warned Asael twice to stop pursuing him. You have in contrast to that, you have Joab. Joab who acted deceitfully. He pulls, he pulls Abner aside in the gateway. It's just to talk to him privately, friendly chat. He's acting deceitfully. And then he killed him. And... This is also interesting. If you're just reading through the text, you probably won't pick up on this. But Joab, he killed Abner 
at Hebron. That is not insignificant. If you go back to Joshua chapter 20, you read about the cities of refuge, where if someone is trying to kill you, you can run to these kind of, we would call them today, sanctuary cities. This is what Hebron was. It was one of them. And you could run to Hebron, go there, and they would let you in, and the person who was trying to kill you, for whatever reason, could not get to you. This happened, Abner, uh, Joab killed Abner at what was supposed to be a safe place for Abner. Ought not to have done that. And lastly, and here's the biggie, Joab, Joab killed Abner in what was considered a time of peace. Abner had killed Joab's brother Asael in what was a time of war. Joab killed Abner in what was a time of peace. You don't pick up on that until later on in Scripture. In 1 Kings 2 verse 5, these are the words of David to his son Solomon. And he's telling Solomon what to do about Joab. Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me, what he did to the two commanders of Israel's army, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime, as if in battle. And with that blood stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Joab, he committed murder, pure and simple. It was an act of revenge on his part. It was an act of retribution, an act of retaliation. And the theologian John Calvin years ago said, if there had been a drop of reason and humanity in him, he ought to have stopped himself from committing such cruelty. Now, there are two takeaway thoughts I leave you with from this passage here. Two takeaway thoughts if you're just writing down notes. The first, this passage is a reminder that we are to submit to those in authority over us. We are to submit to those in authority over us, which Abner did not, uh, not Abner, which Joab did not do. He did not submit to the king who was over him. David, again, he's wanting the king, the kingdom of Israel to be transferred to him peacefully and to be united in peace. And then Joab goes and murders Israel's army commander. That's the kind of action that, plunge, that plunges two nations further into war, is what it does. That's, that's not, that doesn't exactly create peace. That's not really a, a peaceful move. If one, for example, if just by way of analogy, if one member of the conservative party goes and assassinates someone in the Trudeau cabinet, that's not going to bring about peace. It's, I mean, actions like that throughout history have been known to spark wars, if anything. So Joab, he's acting against the wishes of his king. Joab, he didn't have the New Testament, of course, although you do find passages about this issue showing up in the Old Testament that would have been written even when he was alive. But for us today, we have the clear teaching of the whole of Scripture to respect those in authority over us and to not make Joab an example uh, for us to follow. The key word, friends, that pops up is the word submit. In 1 Peter 2, verses 13 to 14, we are told, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king which is what, of course, Joab did not do. As the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. You go down to verse 18. Slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but, all, but also to those who are harsh. And then in the passage that Joanne read earlier, everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. The governing authorities. Whether it be your boss at work, whether it be the politicians who are over you, whether it be the church leaders 
who are over you. Uh, you may not like the decisions that those who are in authority over you make. And again, we've all been there. We've all shaken our head at our boss, uh, internally maybe, but we did it, wondering what in the world they're doing. You may, uh, you may not like the decisions that the church leadership makes. I've spent, quite a, I've spent a long time not liking decisions that my church leaders have made. Not necessarily here at this church, I'll clarify. Not at this church. It was more so at the church where I came from previously. I spent, the, there's a lot of times where I sit there and I just says to myself, I don't know what in the world people are thinking. I don't know what they are doing. We're not instructed in scripture to agree with our leaders. We're not instructed in scripture to turn a blind eye when they make a mistake and we don't hold them accountable. That's not what we're instructed to do at all. But we are instructed to submit. It's the word that's used in all three passages. And in the Greek, it simply means be under obedience or submit self unto. Noah Webster, his definition, he says, and he referred to the passage from 1 Peter when giving this definition, to yield, resign, or surrender to the power, will, or authority of another. And that's to be our position. That's to be our posture toward those whom God has placed in authority over us. You can give your opinion when you don't like what they're doing. You can give them advice along the way when you think that they need it. You can encourage them to act in a particular way. But at the end of the day, you submit. So if I don't like the color that the church sanctuary is going to get painted, which in truth I really don't care too much what color the church sanctuary gets painted, just so long as it's not neon pink or something like that. But if I don't like it, um, I can maybe voice my opinion. And I can offer some advice and say, I think this would maybe look better. But at the end of the day, I submit. It is different, of course, if it is a biblical issue and the leaders are making, an, are making a decision that clearly goes against Scripture. That is the one exception, of course. You find guys in Scripture like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They're individuals who model that. There is a time when you don't go along with the authorities over you. It's when they are going against what God has commanded in Scripture. If David had been doing something immoral, something, if he was leading the nation of the, the, the tribe of Judah, if he'd been leading Israel into sin, well then, um, Joab would have had every right, and indeed he would have been, he would have had the obligation to act against the wishes of the king. If Joab, if, 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 if David were telling Joab to go and do something that was wrong or evil. Even to confront him, this is interesting. I didn't know this, but I read this in a commentary. You remember what Joab said to David? The four words, what have you done? Those are not actually the first, that, that is not the first time that those exact four words are used in Scripture to confront someone. If you go back to 1 Samuel, when Saul did not wait to, for Samuel to offer that sacrifice in 1 Samuel chapter 13, guess what Samuel says to Saul? What have you done? What have you done? And then if you go down two verses, he says, to Sam, he says to Saul, you acted foolishly. He tears a strip out of Saul, the king, for what he did. And so there is a time and a place for confrontation. But it's when, it's when the leader, in this case it was Saul, is going against God's word. David, he's not doing that. He's not doing anything wrong here. Joab, he ought to have submitted. He may not have liked it, 
But you're not called in Scripture to like it again. You're not called to like everything that your leader does. You are called, though, to submit. And then the second thing, that is the first. The second thing that we're reminded of from our text is that we are not to be the ones who are carrying out vengeance. We are to be, the, we are to be letting the Lord settle the score. In Joab's mind, he's taking vengeance. That's what he's doing. He's settling the score. You, you, you read it in verse 27. And there, and here's the word, to avenge, to avenge the blood of his brother Asael. Joab, Joab stabbed him in the stomach and he died. Noah Webster gives the definition for that word. He says to make satisfaction for an injury by punishing the injuring party. To vindicate by inflicting pain or evil on the wrongdoer. As I, now, as I pointed out, um, Abner killed Asael in what was a time of war. After he'd warned him twice to stop pursuing him. Abner, he's arguably not guilty of murder. Joab, though, he obviously doesn't feel the same way. He doesn't feel the same way. But regardless of how he feels in that regard, uh, he's not an example of, what, of how we as Christians ought to be acting. Regardless of whether or not Abner was right or was justified in killing Asael. That's completely besides the matter. We all know what it is like to be wronged by someone. We all know what it is like to feel like we have been wronged by someone. And sometimes those, th th there is a difference there. Sometimes there is a difference. Sometimes you can feel that you have been wronged even though you have not necessarily been wronged. And that would be the case I would argue with Joab here. We all have known of evil being committed. We've all become angry inside. The most difficult for me anyways, one of the most difficult things is when you are watching someone hurt someone you care about. That is when it gets, that's when it gets really frustrating. Because you can, you can hurt me, that's fine. But don't touch someone I care about. That's, a, that, that's taking things to the next level. And when it happens, when it happens, there is the temptation, and here it is again, to take matters into our own hands. That's what we naturally want to do. To punish those who've done wrong, whether it be toward us or toward someone else, we naturally want to hurt those who've caused hurt. To get even, that's what we naturally want to do. I don't know who you've experienced that with in your life, but we all come up against this somewhere along the way. It can even exist, even exist in your marriage, oddly enough, with your spouse. They can hurt you, and you want to hurt them back. And sometimes marriage, unfortunately, it deteriorates to becoming a union where you have two people who have just become experts in hurting each other back and forth. I hurt you, you hurt me, and around we go. Proverbs chapter 24 and 29 says, Do not say, I'll do to him as he has done to me. I'll pay that man back for what he did. That's not to be our response as Christians, to pay others back. To do to others as they have done to us. That is not the golden rule. There's a threefold response I give you just in closing here. Three things that we are to do as Christians. Number one, we are to forgive. You can write that one down. We are to forgive. I grew up saying the Lord's Prayer when I went, when I went to high school. We'd say it at the beginning of each, each and every day. And it's in Matthew 6 and verse 12. I was having a hard time finding the version that we quoted 
every weekday morning in school. Because the majority of versions read something like this. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now I grew up reciting forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's actually an older English version it is, is what it comes from. And I actually think, I'm not 100% sure why the translators go with the word debtor in this case, or why they go with the word debt. I looked them both up in the Greek, and for example, the word debt, so where it says, forgive us our debts, the word debts means also an offense, a trespass, which requires reparation. So there's the word trespass right there. And in regards to the word debtors, the Greek, uh, the Greek definition is one who fails in the performance of duty, generally a transgressor, a sinner. I think it's, it, it, I'm not a Greek expert, friends, but it's perfectly fine what we recited all these years. Forgive us our trespasses. As we do what? Forgive those who trespass against you. Joab was not acting in forgiveness. That's just obvious. The text doesn't come right out and say it, but it's obvious right there. This is a man who's angry, who's bitter, who's resentful, and if you harbor those things long enough, eventually, well, in the case of Joab anyways, it spiraled all the way to murder. That's the first thing, forgive. The second thing is repay with kindness. Do not repay evil with evil, but repay evil with good. Repay evil with good. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 28, But I tell you who hear me, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. And then, fast forward to Romans in chapter 12, and Paul says... Do not, this, this is the passage here that is most clear here. Do not take revenge, my friends. What did Joab do? He took revenge. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, and here it is, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. If he's hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him something to drink. If he's broke down the side of the road, help him change his tire. I was reminded of this because I was, I was out at the, in the White Shell. I, I was actually not that far from John on Wednesday. I was driving bus and I took kids from the inner city out to, out to camp in the White Shell for the day. And the director was telling me because they had a bit of a problem. They were cutting down dead trees in the springtime. And the neighbor, one of the neighbors, because not all the neighbors on the lake by the camp like the camp. They don't always like the noisy kids. So they heard the chainsaw running for a while. And so they called up parks because it's in a provincial park. And they ratted on them because you're not allowed to be cutting down a tree unless you have a permit. It's a most annoying rule. But the camp director didn't know that until the neighbors ratted and called the parks on them. And they were telling me that to, they're trying to be on good terms with the parks. The camp wants to be on good terms with the neighbors. So the staff made cookies and they took them to all the cottagers around the lake area there where they are, even to the cottages where the people, where you have those people who are picking up the phone to call and tell on you because they don't like you. That, my friends, is, and they, they said, you know, they didn't say a whole, you would ring the doorbell and say, we have, we're from the camp and we have cookies, and they quickly take the cookies, say thank you, and close the door. But that, my friends, is an example of what we are to be doing. If, you're, if they're hungry, feed them. Thirsty, give them something to eat. That's what that falls under. That's, that's what we are to do. Not repaying evil with evil. Because in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, boy, I'd love to cut down one of these trees and drag it across their driveway and leave it there for them to clean up. That's the repaying 
evil with evil part. And that's what goes first anyway, sometimes through my mind, I must confess. But we are to be repaying evil with good. And then the next part there that Paul mentions is wait. Wait for justice. Do not take matters into your own hands. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, Paul said. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. The time is coming, friends, when each one of us will stand before God. You will stand before him. The ones who have wronged you will stand before him as well. And they will give an account for what they have done. The Apostle Paul, he said in 2 Corinthians, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good, and there's the other word, whether good or bad. It is, on, it is that day when the wages will be handed out, whether good or bad. It's not our place. It's not our place to act as judge and dish out punishment. It wasn't Joab's place to act as judge, to hand out punishment. It's not our place either. That belongs... That belongs to the Lord, who unlike you and unlike me, always makes perfect judgments. When you have the mindset, I'm going to take matters into my own hands, and you go and you give them what they deserve. Oh, yes, you do. You've, when have you ever made a righteous judgment in that moment? We never do. The Lord, he is the righteous judge. Joab did, Joab did not. He, he didn't act righteously at all in his judgment. The Lord always does. So we leave it to the one who is qualified, who is qualified above all else, above everyone else, to hand out justice. And I leave you. My friends, with the words of C.S. Lewis from his book, The Chronicles of Narnia, this is from Mr. Beaver himself, and he says, Wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight. When Christ returns, wrong will be made right. Wrong will be made right. Your job, my job, is to be patient, to wait for the day when the righteous judge will appear. And next week, we're going to conclude our time in 2 Samuel chapter 3.